Nuno Montero, as you know, has written the seminal book on unipolarity. And he says in that book that the unipole has three options. If you think about it, these make perfect sense. First of all, the unipole can go home because it's so powerful and secure that it doesn't have to sweat what's going on in the rest of the world. You just go home. You won. We won the Cold War. We're Godzilla. Let's go home. Who's going to threaten us? And if the minions want to fight among themselves, who cares? That's one possibility. Second is you can stay involved abroad and use the power you have to maintain the status quo. Or number three, you can stay involved abroad and use that power to do social engineering on a grand scale. That, number three, is what Uncle Sam did. Because Uncle Sam has this liberal impulse hardwired into it. And it, of course, has the capability in terms of raw power. And as I pointed out to you last time, social engineering is at the heart of modern liberalism. Modern liberalism is all about social engineering. And modern liberals have great confidence in social engineering. So when you put the distribution of power, this liberal DNA, which involves this universalist impulse and your belief in social engineering, you're off to the races. And that's exactly what happened after 1989. Talk a little bit about liberal hegemony in action. Uh, you get, as I just said, you get a super ambitious foreign policy. You also get a heavily militarized foreign policy. The United States is a militaristic state. Right? It's really quite remarkable. I'll talk more about this as we go along. We're addicted to war. Uh, and these are liberal driven wars. I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow. Me and my realist friends have been against almost every one of these wars. And it's my liberal friends who are pushing these wars. I have some liberal friends who have never seen a war they didn't want to fight. We have a highly militarized foreign policy. The United States has fought seven separate wars since the Cold War ended. And it's been at war for two out of every three years since 1989. This is remarkable. <laughs> Going back to Nuno's template, I thought we won the Cold War. We could go home and relax. We're so powerful. But no, no, no. That's not what we did. And we did it for liberal reasons. Liberal hegemony action. Two cases. Let's talk a little bit about NATO expansion. Uh, as you know, when the Cold War ended, shortly thereafter, in the Clinton administration, they began to talk about expanding NATO. And as I'll make clear as we go along here, this is the, one of the principal causes of the conflict with Russia over Ukraine. Uh, the first expansion was in 1999. We brought in Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. The second expansion was in 2004. We brought in the Baltic states, Romania, Slovenia, Slovakia, so forth and so on. Uh, and then after 2008, we were talking about bringing in Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, now, when things blew up after the February 22nd, 2014 coup in Ukraine, when things blew up between us and the Russians, they took Crimea, so forth and so on, everybody said the Russians are a threat to overrun Eastern Europe. The whole purpose of NATO expansion was to contain Russia. And thank goodness we were actually moving further and further into Eastern Europe. That's simply not true. That's simply not true. There's no evidence to support that argument. We were moving NATO eastward in large part as an element in a liberal strategy that was designed to take this security community, in the Deutschian sense of the term, that we had created in Western Europe during the Cold War and move it eastward. It included not only spreading NATO, it included spreading the European Union and promoting democracy. You all remember the Orange Revolution in Ukraine and you remember the Rose Revolution in Georgia? This was all designed to take 
this security community and move it eastward. Michael McFaul, who I've debated on this issue of the Ukraine crisis, who was the U.S. ambassador to Russia from 2012 to right before the 2014 coup, says that I told Putin on numerous occasions and I told his lieutenants on numerous occasions that NATO expansion was not a threat to Russia. And he genuinely believed that. Barack Obama has said the same thing. He genuinely believed it. These people who were pushing NATO expansion did not believe in realpolitik and containment. In fact, they said that anyone who believes in realpolitik and containment, and that includes yours truly, is a 17th century person. That's right. We're dinosaurs. That world has gone away with the end of the Cold War. So NATO expansion was not motivated by realist logic. And by the way, virtually all the realists were opposed to NATO expansion and said, this is not going to have a happy ending. And George Kennan gave a famous interview to Thomas Friedman of the New York Times, who wrote it up. And Kennan said exactly that. This is unnecessary, and it's going to lead to big trouble. And surprise of surprises, it led to a war in August 2008 between Russia and Georgia. And in 2014, you ended up with a war between Russia and Ukraine over Ukraine. Right. But it was not driven by realist logic. Bush doctrine, you know, a lot of people will say what's going on in the Middle East or the greater Middle East is that we are uh, pursuing the American national interest in a realpolitik kind of way and just disguising our behavior with liberal rhetoric. Uh, in fact, if you look at what the Bush administration said, that's not true. And as I explained to you about the Iraq case, we went into Iraq for the purpose of turning it into a liberal democracy because we saw that as part of a story where there would be no more war in the Middle East. Once we got beyond Iraq and we got Syria involved and Iran involved and we democratized the entire place, it would all lead to peace, love and dope, and it would take terrorism and nuclear proliferation off the table. That was the basic view here of what we were up to. Uh, of course, it all crashed and burned, but, uh, uh, but that was the initial intention. And by the way, it was a remarkably ambitious foreign policy. I can think of no case in American history where we pursued a foreign policy that was as ambitious and foolish as this. The idea that we were going to democratize the Middle East, a region of the world that had hardly any history of democracy, at the end of a rifle barrel, is really remarkable. And of course, who opposed that war? Mainly realists. Some liberals did, much to their credit, but mainly realists. Why is liberal hegemony doomed? Reason number one. Social engineering in foreign countries is an extremely difficult enterprise under the best of circumstances. Indeed, social engineering in one's own country is especially difficult. But the idea that we can go into a foreign country, we can go into a foreign country where most of the people don't speak the language, don't understand the culture, knock off the regime, right, and therefore create a lot of chaos, and then create order out of that chaos, and not just order out of that chaos, but create liberal democracy or even just democracy, this is a pipe dream. And using the U.S. military for that? I spent 10 years of my life in the U.S. military. I went to West Point. The U.S. military, the U.S. Army, these ground forces that we have, they're good at breaking things. They're good at killing people. They're giant killing machines. The idea that you could take the U.S. Army and send it into Iraq and that it is going to be able to do nation building or state building in a sophisticated way, it's not going to happen, I can guarantee you. You want to send him up against Saddam's army in the middle of the desert in 1991? You want to do that? That's Bambi versus Godzilla, right? That's what the U.S. Army or the U.S. Marines are good at doing, right? But you start talking about taking the American military, putting it in a place like Vietnam, 
put it in a place like Afghanistan and letting it do social engineering, not going to work. Right? But I don't even care if you bring in experts, it's not going to work anyway. And if it does work, it's going to take you a heck of a long time. But there are three other reasons it's not going to work. <laughs> Second is, nationalism is a remarkably powerful force. You've heard me say that on more than one occasion between the last lecture and this one. And it causes the target state to resist foreign intervention. I won't go into a long song and dance about what nationalism is all about. I'd love to do that. But let me just say, self-determination and sovereignty are at the heart of nationalism. Right? The people in a nation state, the nation itself and the leaders who run a state, they want to determine for themselves uh, what their domestic politics look like, and they want to determine for themselves what their foreign policy looks like. Uh, this is what sovereignty is all about. Uh, and they don't want a foreign country, whether it's the United States or the Soviet Union going into Afghanistan or Britain going into Afghanistan or France going into Vietnam. These people don't want foreigners running their politics. They don't want foreigners occupying their country. And who can blame them? As I point out here, think about the U.S. outrage over claims that the Russians interfered in the 2016 election. Apparently, from reading the newspapers, this drives Americans crazy. The idea that the Russians interfered in our elections. Well, we interfere in elections all over the planet. We interfere in the politics of states all over the planet. We think we have a God-given right to go into any country, violent sovereignty, if it's done for just purposes, which means promoting liberal democracy. We have a rich history of it, as you know. But as my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If, we want, if we're jealous gods when it comes to our sovereignty, don't you think that people in other countries are going to feel the same way? Don't you think the Vietnamese, after World War II, are going to want the French out? And then when the Americans replace the French, don't you think they're going to want us out? They are. You think the Afghanis are happy about us being there? You think that this is a long-term solution? Of course, you may believe we can do the necessary social engineering to fix the problem. Getting back to my first point, don't bet on it. You understand that Afghanistan is the longest war in American history, and we have now spent quite a bit more money on fixing Afghanistan than we spent with the Marshall Plan. And look at the results. Not pretty. Reason number three. Individual rights, this whole concept of inalienable rights, are oversold. If you uh, uh, sort of look around the world at surveys and you look at a number of historical cases, what you see is that people generally think rights are important, but they don't privilege them to the extent that the theory says they should. And People will often sacrifice rights for stability. There's a lot of survey data that shows that this is true today in the Middle East. Hardly surprising. If you lived in one of those countries would you, that the United States has helped wreck, would you be interested first and foremost in creating liberal democracy or would you be interested first and foremost in creating some stability? I think the answer is quite clear. Go to Russia today. Right. First time I ever went to Russia, I talked to all sorts of people about this issue. How do you think about liberal democracy? Liberal democracy means one thing to them, the 1990s. Tried that, been there, and it was a total disaster. Thank God we have Putin. If he's not a liberal Democrat, and he is a semi-authoritarian leader, more power to him. That's the answer you hear most of the time. Can you blame them? But what this means is that liberal democracy is not always an easy sell. It's not like you're going abroad and everybody's out there just demanding liberal democracy. Oh my God, this is the most important political system in the world, and if we can just get it, we'll live happily ever after. This is not to say that there aren't many places where they would prefer liberal democracy over some semi-authoritarian system. There are cases like that, but the point is it's not an easy sell. And then finally, some states actually act to balance against the unipol. They act according to realist logic. This certainly has been true 
with China and Russia, and also with Iran and North Korea. I want to talk a little bit more about NATO expansion in a second. The Russians view NATO expansion from a purely realpolitik point of view. Right? This is balanced power politics. The idea that the United States can take a military alliance that was a mortal enemy of the Soviet Union and march it up to Russia's doorstep and make Ukraine and Georgia part of the West, it is not going to happen. They'll tell you that. It is not going to happen for balance of power reasons. And all you have to do is talk about the Chinese, about the presence of the American military in East Asia. It bothers them greatly. They do not like the idea of us being on their doorstep. And they'll tell you behind closed doors they intend to push us eventually out beyond the first island chain and then out beyond the second island chain. And I don't blame them one bit, but I'm just telling you, if you're interested in selling liberal hegemony to major powers in the system like Russia and China, you ought to understand that there are real limits to what you can do. And then, of course, you have minor powers like Iran and North Korea. Look at what North Korea is doing today. People say, oh, what North Korea is doing today is crazy. They're irrational. Kim Jong-un, we've never seen anybody this crazy. The thought of him having nuclear weapons is horrifying. I'd make a case that what Kim Jong-un is doing is very reasonable. If I were Kim Jong-un, I'd have nuclear weapons, and I'd never, ever get rid of them. Never. Why? Because the United States is running around the world knocking off regimes. That's what liberal hegemony is all about. That means if you're not a liberal hegemonic state, Think about what Michael Doyle said. You could be in the crosshairs. And how do you prevent regime change? The best way to do it is have nuclear weapons. We don't like that for understandable reasons. But from their point of view, it makes eminently good sense. Iran, I've said in public on a number of occasions, if I was the Iranian National Security Advisor, they'd already have nuclear weapons. And I can guarantee you that if they had nuclear weapons, the Americans and the Israelis would not be threatening them. Very simple. But the point that I'm trying to make to you here is that some states resist. Not all of them, but some. Some are foolish, like Colonel Gaddafi. We promised Colonel Gaddafi that if he gave up his WMD programs, we'd leave him alone. You know where he is now. He's six feet under. Right? Six feet under. Very foolish. <laughs> bottom line here, <laughs> bottom line here is if you can balance, balance. And some figure that out. So anyway, my basic argument is that liberal hegemony is doomed because social engineering is wickedly difficult. Nationalism causes significant resistance. Individuals right, individual rights matter, but not that much. And it should be number four. Realism remains a key factor for some states. Some states. Talk a little bit about the Ukraine crisis. Uh, as I said to you before, NATO expansion, EU expansion, and spreading democracy were all about, uh, all, all about enlarging the security community that existed in Western Europe. And, and there was even thoughts of eventually bringing the Russians in. It was not balance of power politics. But what happened is that after the April 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest, where we said that Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO, you had shortly thereafter, in August 2008, a war over Georgia, and then in 2014, you had the war over Ukraine. Remember, 2008, April 2008, Look at the communique that was issued after the Bucharest NATO summit. It said that Georgia and Ukraine will become part of NATO. And you had wars involving both of those countries. And the Russians have no intention of letting either Georgia or Ukraine become part of the West. They'll wreck both those countries before they let it happen. This is basic geopolitics. And what's happened to Putin? Putin's standing has gone up significantly. Why? Basic nationalism. Nationalism at home. Factors driving the Russian behavior. Realism 101, nationalism, and stability over rights. That's the Russian story. That's why it's so hard to sell liberal democracy in Russia, the last 
consideration and why the Ukraine crisis happened, first point. And second point about nationalism is why Putin is so popular. 